Welcome to Disciple Disciplines, the podcast about Christian discipline. Soldiers in the Army of the Lord. to episode number eight of Disciple Disciplines. My name is Glenn Ford, your host of these podcasts. Today, I'm going to continue our series on relationships, godly relationships. Last episode, I spoke to you about wives and women and the conduct of a godly wife, a godly woman. We went through scripture and we saw how a woman or a wife can actually influence a husband to sin. We saw way back in Genesis how Adam heeded to the voice of his wife and he ate the fruit, the forbidden fruit, and as a result, a curse came on the earth because of that. And also in all man, because sin now has now entered mankind because of what Adam did. Then we saw with Abraham, how God made a promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. And then Sarah spoke to Abraham and said, look, go into my maidservant Hagar and bear a son through her. So Abraham heeded to the voice of his wife. He went into Hagar and she bore a son, Ishmael, which brought a curse on the earth because through Ishmael came Islam. Then we saw Samson. Samson, God's man, God's soldier, God's warrior for Israel. He also was deceived because of a woman. The enemy brought a woman along, a Philistine woman. He fell for her. She seduced him. And he ended up giving away his secret of his strength. And as a result, he was killed. Then we saw David. David also was led astray because of a woman. Because of his lust, he fell for a woman. Bathsheba, he saw her lying naked. He went to her, took another man's wife, committed adultery with her, and then killed her husband. So he was led to commit murder because of his lust and adultery. And as a result, the son that was born through Bathsheba, the first son, because of that adulterous act, that son then died. Then we saw with Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest king in all the land, the richest king in all the land. God blessed him abundantly with wisdom and wealth. And yet, he also was led astray because of his wives. He had 700 wives. These wives were worshipping idols. They were not following God. And as a result of this, these wives led him astray. And he ended up sinning and worshipping idols and as a result he ended up losing his kingdom. So we saw right through the scriptures this example, the examples of women who can lead men astray, men of God, God's chosen men, and yet they can be led astray and led to sin because of their wives. We also saw through scripture in the last episode that a wife can also bring a man or a husband to Christ through her godly conduct. We saw this in 1 Peter chapter 3, that wives submit to your husbands, even if some do not obey the word, they, by your conduct, by your godly conduct, which was a gentle and quiet spirit in submission to her husband, by that godly conduct, she could then lead her husband, who was not even obeying the word, she could bring him to Christ because of her conduct. And I also shared a testimony last episode of a couple that I know personally who are walking with the Lord. I shared her testimony how she was married to a man who was not a Christian and she found it hard to submit to him because he was not a believer. But she heard in Bible college, she heard a teaching on Christian marriage. She understood that her part as a wife was to submit to a husband. She did that. She had a godly conduct toward her husband. It was gentle and quiet. She was obedient in all things to her husband. She was not nagging him anymore. And as a result, 
that man got saved. The next semester of the Bible college, he was there. He signed up as a student. It was a phenomenal turnaround, and it was so, such a privilege to meet them and to hear their testimony. It was a great privilege for me to meet both of them, and now they're both serving Jesus, and it's wonderful. So we can see this influence of a woman over a husband. She can have a negative influence on him, or she can have a very positive influence on him. Now, today, I'm going to talk about the conduct of a godly husband and a father. It's really important that we go through this, because I have seen so many men, men of God, who are compromising, who are not fulfilling the will of God in their lives, and as a result are seeing all kinds of sickness and weakness and stress and problems in their families because they are not standing up as the men, they are not standing up as the leaders in their households and bringing all kinds of confusion and bringing contention and all kinds of problems because they're submitting to their wives and making all kinds of problems. So we're going to talk about this today, the conduct of a godly husband and a godly father. So go and grab your Bible, go and grab a pen, go and grab something to write on, and let's get into God's Word today. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 3, and we'll see here about God's order between a husband and a wife. We read this scripture last episode. We'll go over it again. We'll see this in chapter 3 of Genesis. This is where Eve was deceived by the serpent. And she ate of the forbidden fruit where God said, do not eat from the fruit of that tree. Um, He commanded that, but she went and did it anyway. She was deceived by the serpent, who then became Satan, and ate of the fruit. Then she gave some to her husband, and he ate of it. And as a result, this curse came upon the earth. And we'll pick this up in here in chapter 3 of verse 16. And now God is speaking, he says, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you, or have authority over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. So we see the curse come upon the earth, because Adam heeded to the voice of his wife. And God said to his wife that your husband will rule over you. So we saw that way back in the beginning how God gave this dominion to man to rule over his wife and not to heed to her deception, not to heed to her when she's being deceived. Let's look at this over in Numbers chapter 30 and we'll see that how this authority that God has given to the husband, to the man, and to the father over his wife and children. Let's look at this over in Numbers, chapter 30. Look at verse 1. That God given the command to Israel through Moses. He says here, Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Okay, this is the Lord's commandment. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. That's pretty clear, okay? God said to the man, Man, if you make a vow to me, then you are bound to keep that vow. Period. Full stop. No ifs, buts, or maybes about it. No, oh yeah, but in this circumstance it's okay. Or in this situation, then it's different. None of that. No, you make, a, you make a vow to the Lord, then you are bound to keep it. But look at this in verse 3. For well, if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by some agreement, while in her father's house, in her youth, as a young woman in her father's house, she makes his vow to the Lord, and her father hears her vow and the agreement by which she has bound herself, and her father holds his peace, doesn't say anything about it, then all her vows shall stand, and every agreement with which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father overrules her on the day that he hears, then none of her vows 
nor her agreements by which she has bound herself, shall stand. And the Lord will release her, because her father has overruled her. That's interesting, isn't it? We're seeing here that a daughter in a, in a father's house, if this young woman loves the Lord and she makes a vow to God, a promise, a commitment to God to do something for him, and her father hears that, her father can overrule that. That's pretty powerful. Then look at verse 6. If indeed this same woman takes a husband while bound by her vows or by a rash utterance from her lips by which she has bound herself, and her husband hears it and makes no response to her on the day that he hears, then her vows shall stand, and her agreements by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband overrules her on the day that he hears it, he shall make void her vow, which she took and what she uttered with her lips, by which she bound herself, and the Lord will release her. Wow. So God is saying here through Moses that if a young lady is in the, in the house of her father, she makes a vow, her father hears it, does not agree with it, he can counsel that vow out, and the Lord will release her. If that woman then gets married and she makes a vow and her husband hears it and does not say anything, then her vow is, will stand. But if he hears it and does not agree with it, he can counsel it out. He has the authority to overrule her and, and he can counsel out her vow that she's made to God and God will release her because her husband overruled her and counseled it out. That is powerful. That is very, very powerful. And that is a responsibility to a husband. Okay, let's keep on reading. Verse 9. Also, any vow of a widow or a divorced woman by which she has bound herself shall stand against her. If she vowed in her husband's house or bound herself by an agreement with an oath and her husband heard it and made no response to her and did not overrule her, then her vows shall stand and every agreement by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband truly made them void on the day that he heard them, then whatever proceeded from her lips concerning her vows or concerning the agreement binding herself, it shall not stand. Her husband has made them void, and the Lord will release her. That is amazing. This is saying that a widow, if she made a vow while her husband was alive, and he heard her vow, that man then dies. This woman is now left a widow, and that man heard those vows while he was alive, and he counseled them out, made them void, even though he's dead. He dies, this woman is now a widow, and what he has said, what he has counseled out, still stands. So her vow will not come to pass. It's been released, because her husband overruled it while he was alive. So even if he dies, he still has the authority of the word still stands. What he said still stands, even though he's dead. That is very, very powerful. Okay? So we see here the authority and the position of a man in a household, in a family. The husband and the father can overrule the vows that his daughter or his wife has made to God. Even if he dies later on, that still stands. It's still made void because he said so. Wow, that's powerful. So we can see the authority of a husband here. Okay? Of a man and a father. Now, let's see here, how does a husband love his wife? First of all, this is an act of love, what we just read. Okay? A husband loves his wife, understanding his position as the head of the family, of the head of his wife that he has authority to counsel out her words, because sometimes women can make an agreement by a rash utterance, as we saw here in verse 6 of chapter 30. If indeed she takes a husband while bound by her vows, or by a rash utterance from her lips, by which she has bound herself, and her husband hears it, then he can counsel it out, because she made a, a vow to the Lord, just basically speaking out of the flesh, a rash utterance. It's not being led by the Holy Spirit. It's just something rash. It's just, just spoken out of the flesh. 
And her husband hears that and he says, no, nah, that ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. That's no, that's no good. I don't agree with that. And he can cancel it out. God said through Moses to the woman, if you make a vow and your husband hears it, then he can cancel it out. But you, husband, if you make a vow, you are bound to it. This is why God commanded women not to have authority over a man or to teach a man. Paul said that in his letters to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, we see that. And also in Timothy, he talks about that. Also in Titus, he talks about that. That women is not to have authority or to teach a man. Paul said that the Lord has commanded this. Now why? Why? Well, we see here in Numbers chapter 30, why? Because sometimes the women can make a rash utterance. We saw in chapter 3 of Genesis that women are easily deceived. Paul talks about that also. That's why the husband can hear what she says and he can counsel it out because he can know that that is just a rash utterance. She's deceived. She's making an agreement and trying to bind herself. And she's deceived. And her husband can pick that up and be discerning of that and counsel it out. So we see the responsibility here as a husband, okay, and as a father. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to see here now then how does a husband actually love his wife? Because we hear the scripture a lot. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Okay, but what does that actually mean? What does that entail? Well, first of all, we just saw from chapter 30 of Numbers, this is entailing a love of a husband to his wife and his children. Okay? By having discernment, by, by knowing what it is a, a rash utterance and what is being led by the Spirit. He has to have an understanding of that. He has to has discernment of that. That's one way that he loves his wife. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. We spoke about this in the previous episode about wives submitting to their husbands. But we talked about from verse 1 about the conduct of a Christian person. How do we have a relationship with each other? Not to have fellowship with darkness and let the light expose the darkness and so on as we read from verse 1 of chapter 5. And then we get down to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, people preach that and they stop right there. That's that one verse. Okay, but what is that? How does Christ love the church? How does Christ give himself for it? Let's have a look at that. Let's continue reading. Verse 26. That he might sanctify it set it apart, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself as a glorious church, a glorious congregation of people, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it, the body of Christ, his people, should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, if he loves his wife, loves himself. Now, Paul just describes here how a husband loves his wife and how Christ loves the church. Christ loved the church by giving himself for it. Gave him what? He gives it the word. He sets it apart, his body, us, his people. He sets us apart by his word. His word cleanses us. His word sanctifies us, sets us apart. And that word, if that word is submitted to, then his word presents us holy and without blemish and without spot. Yeah? Now, a husband loves his wife as his own body. So if I'm loving my wife, I'm I'm presenting the word. I bring the word to my family. I bring the word of God to my wife and my children. Okay? The instructions of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, I bring this to my family, and that is then submitted to, then we see that they are then presented holy and blameless and without spot or wrinkle. Amen? Now, if I'm doing that, I'm also loving myself. If I'm bringing the word to my family, to my wife, then I'm also loving myself because the word that's cleansing them is also cleansing me. Amen? (laughs) So this is how a husband loves his wife as his own body. Yeah? How Christ loved his body the same way. He cleanses it with his word. Let's go look at this in John chapter 15. Jesus said here, about the word, about the word cleansing. In chapter 15, verse 3, he's talking to his disciples, and he says, You are already clean 
because of the word which I have spoken to you. You see that? The word cleanses. The word cleans you. Then he says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless you abide in me, abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then he says, in verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciple. So you will prove yourself to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. See the emphasis of the word here. If I abide in you, and my words abide in you. What I have said, what I am saying, abides in you, lives in you, takes residence in you. Then you'll ask what you desire, it shall be done for you. And what does Proverbs say? Proverbs 4. He says, get the word in your heart. Don't let it depart from your eyes. Let it go into your heart and it will produce life. Life and health to all your body, all your flesh. Amen? So we see the power of the word. We see in James how James says, receive with meekness or humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Yeah? What does the psalm say? The psalm says his word gives light. Amen? This is how a husband loves his wife. So, husbands, you love your wives by bringing the word of God. Bring the word. It cleanses. It sets us apart. It makes us holy and without blemish. It saves our soul. That word saves uh, in that James. Saves your soul. In that word means to preserve, heal, deliver, okay? That's all encompassing that word saves. So the word cleanses, the word delivers, the word sets us apart, the word heals. Amen? So you receive that with humility. So, this is how a husband loves his wife. It's just the same way as the church is loved by Christ by giving it the word. Now, when the church submits to the word, then it will be cleansed and holy and without spot or wrinkle, okay? And being an example of Christ. Same way that wives submit to a husband, she's submitting to the word, the children submit to the word, and there's blessing in the family. Amen? Make sense? So we see the importance of the authority of a husband over his wife and his children, and he is to love them by bringing the word, teaching the word to his family. Now, if that is their responsibility as husbands, then we need to know the word. Yeah, we need to understand it. We need to be proficient in it. Let's go and look what Paul said in Timothy about this. Let's look at chapter 2 of Timothy. Paul is writing his letter to his disciple Timothy, who is a minister or a bishop of the church in Ephesus. And he says here in verse 15, Be diligent, Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Okay? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God by rightly dividing the word of truth. Get sound knowledge of the word of truth. Understand it. Let's continue over in chapter 3. Let's go to the first 14 of chapter 3. Paul was saying to Timothy, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures. Timothy had known the scriptures, the word of God, since he was a child. Yeah? which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. You can teach it for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Now, people can say, yeah, but that was to Timothy. He was a pastor. That was his responsibility to the church. That's correct, yes. 
But this also stands for all of us. Okay? And we can see that with the husband and a father is to bring the word of God to his family. So he must have sound knowledge of the word. You must be diligent in the word. You must educate yourself on the word. You must get your eyes in the word. You must have understanding of what God's instructions are. Then you can bring them to your family. If you love your wife by bringing the word, you love your children the same way. Now let's look at that about fathers. We spoke about husbands, how you love your wife. Husband, you have authority. You have responsibility in your house as, a, as the head. God requires of you to take your responsibility to bring the word to your family, to your wife. Okay? And not compromise with that. Let's go and look at what God says about fathers. Let's go back to Genesis. And we're going to see here, why did God choose Abraham? Abraham is known as the father of many nations. Now let's go and see why did God choose Abraham? Was it just because of his faith? No, I don't believe so, because we can go through the scriptures and we see there's many men and women of faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. It gives the big list of all those people, the men and women of God, who were people of faith. Abraham is listed in that, but there are many others as well. So that's not why God chose Abraham, because he was a man of faith. So why did he call Abraham? Why did he choose Abraham? Let's kind of look at it in Genesis. Genesis chapter 18, from verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him. Or blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Now, we see here this is why God chose Abraham, because God knew that Abraham would be trustworthy, that he would command his children and his household and all those after him to keep the commandments of the Lord, yeah, and to do righteousness and justice. That's why God chose Abraham. And we see later when God tested Abraham when he brought Isaac, he asked him to sacrifice Isaac, yeah? We know the story. Abraham obeyed that, brought his son son up to to the mountain where he was going to kill him. And then God stopped him and God said, now I know that you will obey me, that you're a man after my own heart, and so on. So we see that. So that's why God chose Abraham. Not because he was a man of faith. That had a part to do with it. But specifically, to be the father of many nations, because he knew that Abraham would bring these commandments of the Lord to his family. Amen? That's why he chose Abraham. We need to be the same as men, as fathers. Okay, we see back in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's go and look at that. Chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. God's given his commandments. He says here, in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Wow. You see that? Be diligent to teach these commandments of the Lord to your children. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down at night, when you rise up again the next morning, consistently be diligent to teach your children the commandments of the Lord. Amen? Let's go and look at Proverbs here. What else? How do we love our children? How do we raise up our children in the ways of the Lord? We teach them the commandments, yes. But let's see how we teach them. How do they learn? Let's go and look at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So, we see from Deuteronomy chapter 6 that we are to 
be diligent to teach the commandments of the Lord to our children. Why? So when they're old, when they grow up, they will not depart from it. Amen? If we back up the verse 4 in Proverbs 22, we'll see here, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honour and life. So therefore, do verse 6, train up your child in the way he should go. Why? Because by humility and the fear of the Lord, teach the children the fear of the Lord, then they'll have riches and honour and life. Amen? The commandments of the Lord are for our good. And as husbands and fathers, we have the responsibility. Men, you're listening to this podcast today. It is your responsibility as the husband, as a father, as a man of God, to be diligent in the Word of God, have sound knowledge of the Word of God, and then bring that to your family. Bring it to your wife and your children. Amen? So when your children grow up, they'll be rooted in it, they'll be grounded in it, and they won't depart from it. Far too many times we see so many children who grow up in Christian families and then they become adolescents and they depart from the faith. They leave. They go into the world. Why? Because they have not been trained up in the way that they should go. So what happened? They departed from it. They departed from the Lord. Okay? I've seen this with people I know and it's so sad. They will say, yeah, but we trained them up. No, you didn't. Because the scripture says, if you train up a child in the way you should go, then he would not depart from it when he gets older. Okay? So if they're departing from it, it's because they have not been trained up in the ways of the Lord. You have to be diligent in it. And there is discipline that is required. Let's look at that. We need to understand, in order to bring these commandments to our children, there has to be discipline. Okay? Discipline is good. Let's look at this. This is how we love our children. Okay? Let's look at this over in chapter 13 of Proverbs. In verse 24, he says, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him, he who loves his son, disciplines him promptly. Because we love our children, we discipline them. And sometimes you've got to use the rod. Yeah? The rod of correction. Let's look at this over in chapter 23, verse 13. Do not withhold correction from a child for if you beat him with a rod he will not die you shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell now the western mindset can read that and think that's child abuse beating your child with a rod see that is a problem with the western mindset there is no discipline with children today we have children growing up who are disobedient to their parents who have forsaken the Lord, forsaken their parents, and in some countries, children are actually starting to sue their parents. It's ridiculous. It's rebellion. Because parents are afraid to bring discipline to their children, bring correction from when they're young children. Yeah? With the rod of correction. Now, it's not not talking about beating them to a pulp. It's not talking about abusing your children. That's not what I was talking about. But it's just using discipline. Smacking your children is good for them. Let's look what it says over in chapter 29 of Proverbs. Look at verse 15 in chapter 29. The rod and rebuke give wisdom. You see that? But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Verse 17. Correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Amen? So we see the importance of bringing correction. Stern correction. Let's go and look at this over in Hebrews. In Hebrews, we're going to see about this correction. Why would God command us to not withhold the rod to our children? Well, we just saw in Proverbs because it brings wisdom. Yeah? Discipline is good. Let's look in Hebrews what, what it says here. Let's look at verse 5 of chapter 12 in Hebrews. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. That word chastens means corrects, brings correction. And scourges every son whom he receives. Wow. 
If you endure chastening, then God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? And any father who loves his children, who loves his son, will chasten them. But if you are without chastening, of which all have, have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. So we shall not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed, our natural fathers, they indeed for a few days chastened us as it seemed best to them. But he, but God, for our profit, so that we may be partakers of his holiness. You see what chastening does? Brings holiness, righteousness, not carnality, not sin, not complacency. Verse 11 says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nobody likes it. But nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Yeah? So discipline is necessary. And discipline requires sometimes using the rod. Okay? Smacking your children is okay. Don't listen to the world and things in the church that are saying, well, you shouldn't do that because that's abuse and that kind of silly rot. No. Otherwise, your children will be growing up to be rebellious, otherwise. So we can see how a father loves his children. By bringing the word, and if the word is not submitted to, then the child is disciplined, corrected, penalized for that. Yeah, just as God chastens us. Amen. How else are we to love our children? Let's have a look. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3, and we'll see here about fathers how they are to love the children. Fathers, in verse 21, chapter 3, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. So, we can discipline them, even use the rod if necessary, and do that without provoking them. How do you do that? How do you not provoke your children? Are they not going to be provoked when you bring out a big stick and try to smack them with it, or bring out your hand and smack them across the bum with something? Are they not going to be provoked? Well, there is a way we can do that. If we address them, son, daughter, this is what the word is. Your father's brought this truth. If you're not doing it, then this is the penalty. Okay? So that the child then knows that they have done wrong and they'll be penalized for it. They're not going to get provoked for that. Not to provoke your children means don't irritate them. Okay? Don't make unnecessary demands on them. Don't irritate them. Love them. But love is bold. Love does not compromise. Love hates sin. Okay? So we don't provoke them by giving unreasonable demands on them, and we don't provoke them by irritating them. Okay? Again, in chapter 6 of Ephesians, Paul says this here again to the Ephesians, in verse 4, And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and the admiration of the Lord. Teach them the commandments of the Lord. Teach them to fear the Lord. Teach them to trust the Lord. I know with my children, many times, they've asked me for something. I'll say, ask God for it. Believe the Lord for it. Teach them to have faith. Teach them to practice faith. Teach them to pray. Teach them to know the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord starts to teach them. The Lord gives them dreams and visions and understanding and revelation. This is the father training up his children. And God uses the father to speak to the family. Okay, husbands, men, this is your responsibility. Use it. Do it. Okay? Husbands, love your wives by bringing the word of God. Teach the word of God. Be the word of God. Live it yourself. Don't compromise. Don't heed to deception. Don't think you're keeping peace because your wife doesn't agree with something. It is the word of God. It is to be submitted to. For our good. For the family's benefit. Okay? 
Fathers, raise up your children, teach them the commandments of the Lord when they're young. When they're very young, start to teach them. For example, when I'm doing ministry, people coming to my home, I'll have my children there with me. And my children will see how I minister to someone. My children will see the power of God healing somebody. My children will see people being set free by the power of God. My children will see demons being cast out of people. They will see this. They'll experience it. And they're not afraid. They're learning. They're understanding. This is normal. This is the normal Christian life. This is what we do. Yeah? This is who we are. They're understanding God. They understand how to believe God. Understand the leading of the Lord. We teach them and be diligent in it. Okay? You have to be diligent in it. Now, that's it for me today on this episode. Next episode, I'm going to bring this series of relationship to a conclusion, and I'm going to talk about the marriage. I'm going to talk about what do we do if we're in a marriage and the spouse leaves. If your husband leaves you, or if your wife leaves you, what do we do in that circumstance? Because the fact is, that happens. Not everybody is willing to take up their cross and follow Christ. Not even those in your own family sometimes. And we've got to acknowledge that, we've got to realize that many people left Jesus, right? Paul the Apostle had the same problem. He said that all those in Asia had left him. He said that Demas had left him and gone back into the world. This happens. Jesus said that your greatest enemies will be those of your own household. So this happens. It is a fact. I'm going to be talking about this in detail next episode. And in that episode, I'm also going to share a personal testimony that happened to me in my marriage about a year and a half ago. I had a remarkable vision one night. I was on a Monday night. I'd just come in from the street, and I was talking to my wife about what the Lord had done that night on the street. And we went into prayer, and I had this very profound vision. I want to share that with you next episode, because in that vision had a lot to do about my marriage. And what actually happened not long after that vision in my marriage? It was a very painful experience. And now I've been through it. The Lord has given me some insight and some revelation of how I can help others with this who are going through this. Because people will leave you. That is a fact. In the next episode, we're going to talk about marriage. What about divorce and remarriage? What did Jesus say about that? Why did the Apostle Paul talk about it? Is divorce sin? Is remarriage sin? Is it adultery? We need to talk about that. Because unfortunately we see today in the churches some pretty bad examples. We need to get to the bottom of this. We need to talk about what Jesus said. What does the Word of God say about it? And obey it. So we're going to talk about all that in the next episode. So until next time, remember to love one another. Be diligent to teach the Word of God. Fathers, Teach the word of God to your children. Raise them up in the ways of the Lord, in the admiration and the fear of God. Husbands, bring the word of God to your wife. The word of God cleanses, it washes, it sets us apart, it sanctifies, it makes us holy and blameless before God. Wives, obey, submit to your husband who's bringing the word of God to you. Okay? For this is for our good. Be obedient to God. Be obedient to His Word. And continue in it and don't compromise on it. So until next time, God bless you. Amen.